Thank you, Bob, for that exceptionally warm and complete, <laughs> complete narrative of my life. Gosh. Uh, I do realize when I hear how long I've been at Yale that I have been there a very long time. People can't believe I'm going to California. I really can't believe it myself, but it will happen. Uh, I also um, would like to be able to thank uh, the Hoffman Reffer for uh, inviting me to give the Jane Powell Dwyer lecture. Uh, I never met Jane Powell Dwyer, but when I was writing my dissertation, I sat beside someone who, had, who was writing a dissertation on a topic where Jane was the known expert. And she had all of Jane's, every paper, everything Jane had ever written out always on her desk. And so I feel as though I have some kind of generational cousin-like connection um, to, uh, to Jane Dwyer. And I'm delighted to be here uh, in her name. Uh, I'm also, I'm, I'm sorry that my colleague, Steve Houston, isn't here, one of the colleagues I've collaborated most with over my, uh, over my career. Uh, and I think he will be relieved to know that of the many things Bob just said I was going to do, I won't be doing any linguistics. <laughs> I promise that if, 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 that if, if uh, maybe I could only get away with that when, when Steve isn't in the room. But I won't even try. Uh, it's not on tonight's menu. And thank you for giving that, uh, that uh, information about, uh, uh, about Haina Island, because you've kind of set the stage. And maybe there are a few things that I don't need to say, um, because you've said things so very well. So we are going to be looking at Haina figurines. We're going to be looking at them in a new light. Uh, so I have to say that this is one of those stories where I'm in the story a little bit. And it's because um, I, was, I was an undergraduate at, at Princeton, and I got very interested in this question of these, of these figurines. And this is one, an example that's part of the Princeton collection that I've published three times. And I feel like I am the luckiest person on earth. I am the luckiest person on earth because I get to be the person to say, Mary Miller, she knew nothing. <laughs> Mary Miller, you made a lot of mistakes. Mary Miller, you didn't get um, everything right about this uh, category of figurines. And I knew, I felt that there was much more to be done with these figurines than I had done in the past. So this particular figure, published her three times, I actually went to see her out of the case. Those are my fingers in the blue gloves <laughs> holding on to her. And I went down, actually, Princeton had their pre-Columbian collection off view. They own so many Heine figurines, I couldn't actually see them all in the day and a half I had scheduled for myself to be there. I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things. There's red paint that survives on the face and the, just the upper part of the chest. But most of all, look at the thing around her neck. Um, I've been looking at these figures for so long that I did not see what you all see, because I'm telling you to see this. But I think, in fact, it's partly because these figurines are so beautiful. It's back to that same old problem of Maya art. It's so enchantingly beautiful that we do not see that that is a rope around her neck. And then I started looking. Sample through the glass, Mexico City. I just started, um, and thank God I decided to do this project in the era of the iPhone. And I want to say, if you want to get really good pictures of Heine figurines, in fact, Leah saw me do this today. You, put, you wait until no one's looking, and you put your phone on the glass. And that's how you get those beautiful details, um, like this one. Um, sorry, Bob. You're the museum director. Um, uh, so here we are looking at Yucatan Peninsula and a little bit more of Mexico and Guatemala. And there are two places. There's Haina. And I also want to draw your attention to Chicalongo which you did not know was going to be in this and will not be on the final exam, <laughs> I promise. 
um, for this. But I want to draw your attention to these two places. Um, so have those in mind. We'll be coming back to them. Every, it, it, it's hard, even as an art historian, not to include a map um, when you're talking about the ancient Americas. So what kinds of, what do we know about women in Maya art? We know a lot about them. Um, they, uh, <clears throat> they are, uh, they serve all kinds of roles, and they often have this red face paint. Uh, men tend to have red body paint from the neck down. Women tend to have it from the neck up, sometimes uh, quite limited. So it's kind of interesting that we've got this body paint. Um, we see them at court. We see them in uh, what look like fairly noble um, uh, activities. We see them uh, preparing chocolate. That's an col uh, early colonial manuscript on the right. Um, but we see on this Maya vase, they're pouring chocolate. It's how you bring the, the froth up on the chocolate. And uh, we see women who, although not rulers in their own right usually, um, play uh, an important role at court um, in the case of uh, Lady Katuna Howe at Piedras Negras, she is the equivalent of Eleanor of Aquitaine, someone who has uh, power through inheritance and a missing absent father, no brothers. She is the one everyone wants to be. Uh, she is an important uh, bride, and she brings an enormous amount of political clout to the Piedras Negras court, so much so that her daughter is also um, depicted here in one of the rare depictions of a Maya child. So kinds of women um, are definitely heard and seen in Maya art. They're not invisible. They have power. We occasionally see, as we do at Yashchilan, that a woman might even commission a building suggests a number of things. Oh, if Steve were here, we could have a good fight about literacy. It's one of my favorite arguments to have with him. Um, and I'm sorry this is on tape. I better, I better behave. Um, but uh, he will. He will. Hi, Steve. Um, but where we have women who commission a building um, with their inscription, uh, at Yas Chilon, suggesting a certain kind of both economic power and desire, not just for economic power, but to have it be written as to who has uh, come up with the, uh, the wealth that stands behind such a construction. We also see women. Uh, this uh, painting uh, discovered now about 16 years ago. Um, at Kalak Mool, maybe actually a little bit before that. Pay no attention to the word temperature warning. It seems to go away after a while. Um, where this is a larger than life painting of this, what I would say that she is a powerful hostess here in this uh, representation. If we take a closer look at her, we can see the red face paint also on the woman in the drab, non-transparent gray dress. So we get to see that there are definitely class distinctions here. The gauzy blue dress. Um, the, the one who says, yeah, it, it only weighs about 40 pounds. Here, you carry it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the attention that the artist has given through the underdrawing to her voluptuous body. Well, there's something about that blue dress. And we're going to be coming back to it because we're going to see that blue dress time and again on Heine figurines. And it's a certain kind of blue dress associated, by and large, with voluptuous women. And if you take a good look at these two voluptuous women in front of you, you see that they both have the, a, what looks like a rope around their neck. It suggests that we should interrogate the question of enslavement among the Maya. What do we know about enslavement among the Maya? Well, we know that one of the most famous people, indigenous people of the 16th century, 
is someone who was enslaved at that moment of the Spanish invasion. And I'm sure you've all heard of her because she is so famous. And she's usually known as La Malinche. She's also known by her Nahuatl name, Malintzin, and she's known by her Christian name that she's baptized, Marina. And we see her in this picture from the Florentine Codex, where, which by the way, the indigenous um, uh, painter has made look like a woodcut. You want to see the authority of the new technology? Adopt it. If you want your picture to have meaning, adopt that new, the, so they were not making uh, uh, early colonial Az or Aztec woodcuts, but this is um, emulating that. So in this, we see uh, two people that I've drawn to your attention. Marina, who seems to be direct to the scene, and that would seem to be Cortez. They're not, they're not captions here, uh, <coughs> who is writing it all down in a book at the moment that the ships are being unloaded. And those of you who know your invasion story know that then Cortez has the ships burned so that there's no going back at this moment. Well, who's Marina? Marina, this is a calendar picture. Um, I, I bought this calendar um, in order to have this picture, you can be assured. Um, this is not Marina. I mean, it's not how I think of Marina. I'll show you uh, what I think are actually, as a, as a little sidebar, the two most important women of the 16th century. Now, they couldn't have met each other, because she dies in 1529, and she's born in 1533. But I think they make a very interesting counterpart, uh, counterpoint to one another. Um, Marina, we do not know um, how old she was at the time that the Spaniards came to her town of Chicalonga, uh, Chicalonga, where she was one of 20 women given to the Spanish. They were baptized and then promptly raped. What else could it have been when they were women were parceled out to the to the individual men? She had the great good fortune as Something about her made it important that she be given to the most important nobleman among Cortez's uh, troops, someone much more important than Cortez himself. And uh, <clears throat> she was very quickly recognized to be a multi a bilingual in that she spoke uh, Maya and she spoke Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs. Uh, it's a long story that people have compared to biblical narratives of uh, David and Bathsheba. I won't go into that today, but only to say Cortez managed to, to find a reason to send that uh, high-ranking nobleman home with the news from New Spain, what would be New Spain, and uh, quickly enough, Marina is in his tent. Uh, I show you where they were traveling along Yucatan, um, here, Chicalongo. They're on their way to Quetzalcoatlcos, where they will unload the ships and move inland. Uh, they've already picked up the famous Geronimo de Aguilar, uh, the shipwrecked uh, priest who speaks, because he's been a slave, enslaved among the Maya for a decade, speaks Maya and obviously Spanish. Maria speaks a different Mayan language. and. Nahuatl. So we've got a bit of a telephone game. You could imagine that we can begin to communicate. Uh, what's interesting about all this is that there were some other bilingual, there was at least one other bilingual woman that we, uh, that was in the group. One of the cooks was, uh, uh, who had come with the Spanish from Jamaica, also spoke Maya. Uh, but it turns out that it was not just being bilingual, it was being really smart and figuring out how to read the tea leaves of this brave new world. I'm telling you all this about Marina because Marina was an enslaved person 
in a wealthy Maya household. She had been taken probably when she was 12 or 13 from her Nahuatl-speaking family in Quetzalcoatlcos and taken back, taken to Chicalanco, a Maya-speaking town. She's a, is she 16? Is she 18? We don't know. Has she had any children? We don't know. What's a girl like that good for in a, in a, in a household? She's probably taking care of other people's children. Maybe she's having children. Maybe she is, I'm going to use the word sex slave. Maybe she is brought in to be some kind of concubine. We don't really know. But I think it's important to think about what is a young, attractive woman of this age likely to have to be fulfilling in that Maya household. And if I would just recommend to you all Camilla Townsend's excellent biography that she has created for, um, for Malinche, for uh, Marina, um, in which she asks all these very good questions. Well, Marina is incredibly able. And uh, it, it's fascinating. When the uh, Lienza de Tlaxcala was published in a uh, facsimile form in 1983 in Mexico, one of the things that the commentator said is, uh, Marina's in every scene. She must be totally irrelevant. I'm sorry, could, could you explain that to me again? <laughs> the, she's in every scene. She's the frontal person. She's the largest person. She's often looming right over Cortez. She must be the most important person in here, in these pictures, as the indigenous artist has understood this narrative. Uh, she's the only person who ever wears shoes. Um, and when this image is, and her shoes are cute, I think they look like little deerskin booties. Um, she has different clothes in every single scene in this manuscript. I admire every aspect of some, the person who has made this depiction, who could not have known her. Now we know something about the transformation of deities in the early colonial period. Um, this is work that was done probably now about 25 years ago by Margaret Arvey, who noticed that the uh, goddess, uh, the flower Quetzal, uh, such a Quetzal, is described as a, as a prostitute she, in, in uh, the Florentine Codex. And it, it is quite interesting how, what the models are for this, probably, you know, Venus uh, and Botticelli also, some, what the models are for this new representation uh, and, and seeing uh, that an, a pre-Hispanic goddess becomes a prostitute in European parlance. I just, you just have to enjoy what happens to at least one male god, Tlaloc, is based on Apollo. He gets to retain his divineness, uh, his divinity, uh, in, the, in the form of uh, a Roman deity. So that's for the Joukowsky Institute. Just a little bit of Rome had to step in the door. Uh, anyhow, uh, just to give you a sense that uh, being an enslaved person did not diminish um, uh, Marina's capacity to step forward and be the agent and the spokesman who could manage all of this complicated, uh, all these complicated notions that were in flux. She probably understood the world better than any other indigenous person for the first 20 years um, of that invasion. With that, um, but it also, we know, we know that um, people become enslaved, enslaved because they are captured. We also know that because you are enslaved as an indigenous person does not mean, so in that wealthy household where she was an enslaved person, if she gave birth to her children were not enslaved. The child of an indigenous, uh, a, a Maya person enslaved was not enslaved. Um, uh, not by, uh, and so if that child was particularly talented or skilled or a great warrior, all those things gave that person opportunity to um, chart a different course. 
Which takes us now back to Heine, and we'd better get back to Heine or I'm going to be in trouble here. So what do we know about Heine? And uh, I'm showing you the copy of the book from the Tazer Library, which I scanned every word of because uh, this book is extremely hard to get. And Heine is a kind of swampy um, morass made almost entirely of saskab, which is um, a kind of uh, a Maya almost, uh, it's kind of like clay, it's slippery when it's wet. Um, it's, a, it's limestone, it's, uh, and it was hauled here, so um, Antonio Benavides believes, it was that most of this island is artificially built up. That there was perhaps something here, but most of what, of, what is here is hauled from the mainland. And you can perhaps see it a little bit better here. And it was separated from the mainland coast by this mangrove swamp. So in fact, um, mangroves are essentially impossible to move through. Uh, it meant that all access to this island was by canoe, and it was extremely isolated. If you want a place that is a good port, and you are, your goods are secure, and any people that you wish to retain on the island are secure, this would be a kind of ideal setting. And so I think that not only does Antonio Benavides have it right, that it's a city, a port, and a market, but that as we will see, that uh, many of the figurines that have been recovered from this island, and there are, by my count, I'm going to guess that I'm going to end up with a number, something like 15,000 Heine figurines. I only have 1,000 in my database at this point, but they are, they just keep coming. You gave me a new one today. Um, you've got a that you've got a couple little mold-made ones out in uh, your storage unit as well that are not in the database. Uh, there are thousands of these figurines. And where have they come from? What is archaeology like on Heine? Heine is an island that was being looted um, at the time that Campeche was a great town for the cotton trade of Mexico, back in the mid-19th century. And I'll show you some of those collections in just a second. It is the, um, it, 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 its brand name as, a, as the name of these figurines goes right back into the 1860s and 70s, if not sooner. But Antonio Benavides, who's been working out on Heine, has, been, has restored this pyramid. And gosh, at the time that that book was published, it said, and the site is about to open to the public. Hasn't happened. I'd like to be among the first to go. But as he reconstructed this pyramid, what he found on axis at the base of the stairs, exactly where you would expect to find some Maya burials, it has been reconstructed like this. And, it, and what you can see are six planks, and then bones in four locations. So these aren't numbered. I don't know why we have one, two, three, and no four. Um, it's possible that it's thought that these leg bones belong with skeleton number two. Um, but that the, the, it is the first discovery where there is some archaeology. Um, and the, they were found jumbled. They, things had slid around. The bodies were very close together. This is not a very big uh, space. But I want to show you skeleton number two, um, probably a female, they say, and certainly the most important figure in here, mold made. So I, I think at all of the sequences that have been laid out, I have just thrown out and instead been looking for meaning. This is, I believe, about as good as the archaeology is going to ever get. And it's partly because this site has been looted so systematically 
for over 150 years that I think most of it looks like a moonscape. Well, let's go back to 1878 because it's then when, um, and I, I know that this is not a very attractive kind of figurine, but I want to say this is also one of the few molds ever found on Haina. And <coughs> these are all, uh, all the original cards are there, um, uh, written out in, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't think this is written by Isaac Himeno, but he gave a collection of nearly 300 Heine figurines to the Berlin Museum in 18, uh, you can see different dates, this one's 84, um, and it includes every possible type of Heine figurine right down to female figures with ropes around their neck. And the, the duck bill, uh, there are only a handful of these, but God bless him, Isaac Himeno got a duck bill too. Um, it's a, a and uh, there's no reason to believe that the figurines were coming from anywhere but Heine um, and being brought into Campeche. He also founded the Campeche Museum, but he gave this entire collection to Berlin. Berlin, the center of culture, of course, in the 19th century. So uh, I love this, the Heine pyramid at the Museo Nacional. Uh, this is many people love the Heine. Kind of pyramid. Uh, the more mold made the figures are, the close they are to the bottom. They've tried to set up some kind of class structure here. Just um, it's it's fun to look at it. Um, I'm a big fan of the pyramid, even though um, I, I don't I don't think anyone necessarily thinks that it's showing status from top to bottom. But it's a great display of these figurines. And these are figurines that were excavated on Heine in 1963, in 1955, and in the 40s by the Mexican government. Um, the ones that Antonio Benavides has excavated are on view in uh, Campeche in the um, museum, the Fuerte San Miguel. Uh, one of the things that is interesting about Heine figurines is the question of the, the, the way they are made from molds. Uh, there are, they're often identical examples. So for, uh, and so for example, um, here's a figurine, slight differences in all of them. Uh, surely some kind of dancer with her hands together like this. Um, and uh, the figure, each one of these is a rattle. There's one actually on that Heine pyramid in Mexico City. I think I know about seven that are made from this mold. Um, so what about uh, female figurines? Because that's where we started. And you know, it, it's interesting. We often think of uh, figurines such as this one. She's at the Yale University Art Gallery. She's been there on view since 1958. And uh, she was, until very recently, described as a captive. She's naked, all right. And it's funny, I do know a a uh, 1950s photograph of her that someone had put sort of a fig leaf. Um, it's hard to tell what it was, but some kind of, but uh, let me just say that it's very interesting to look at nude Maya women. And they are often in the company of the maze god. They are bringing him back to life. And here's something that characterizes these nude Maya women, stretch marks. They are not maize maidens bringing the maize god back to life. These are maize matrons. These are tried and tested. These are women who can demonstrate their fertility. And I think that's probably what's going on with this figurine as well. She's not a, she's not a captive. She's not enslaved. She is, um, she's a maize goddess of some sort. And we see these um, in the paintings at San Bartolo as well, these very early paintings. Here, this is Heather Hurst's reconstruction, um, where uh, these women, four women who are attending the maze god's rebirth, are probably also this woman, these women who can uh, bring him back to life and demonstrate their fertility. We started with Greeny, as I like to call her. Um, it, 
at the very beginning, uh, this is an, as she is depicted on the cover of an exhibition catalog in 1971 in London. Uh, she's now part of the Mundo Maya collection in, uh, on view and part of a kind of nationalized collection in Merida. Uh, often said to be a dancer, I think she is. She's a whistle. Uh, if you want to play her, you treat her fairly rudely because the whistle is at what seems to be the back part of the dress. So you usually turn these figures upside down. You have disoriented them. And you are uh, blowing air into a part of the, um, uh, near the human anatomy that might seem to be rather rude. She has a rope around her neck. And it turns out to be very typical of many of these dancing women. There's another one, lower right. Here's the very, the very figurine that we started with um, this evening. Do you see where there is a whistle? In most of these uh, beautiful women in blue dresses, there's a little trace, few traces of blue on this one. The blue is Maya blue. It is a very tenacious pigment that is made by heating the silica clay palygorskite that's found around a couple of cenotes in Yucatan along with indigo. It is one of the most tenacious post-fire blue paintings ever invented in the history of the world. Um, you play here in her calf. She has the blue on her headdress. These, here's one that's in the MFA in Boston. Typically, the handmade pieces break off. And these, <coughs> Uh, sometimes these women are shown working, but look at how the rope is exceptionally explicit. So we've had a hard time seeing this rope. We want to see it as a braid, um, a choker. When I read um, catalog, rec uh, catalog information about these figurines, those are the terms I see. I never find the word rope. Um, but a rope it is. And there's something else that many of these women have, and that is particularly beautiful um, depiction of some sort of scarification or tattooing on their cheeks. And I suspect that this is the same kind of thing we see with Lady Shock at Yash Chilan. You can actually see it's almost the exact same patterning. Perhaps it can be temporary as well as permanent. But what does it mean? I think it probably means that they are, <coughs> that these are women who can sing, who can perform, they can recite poetry, they can chant, they are, um, they are expressive in their words. Uh, they make the same gestures time and again. I wish I had a good answer for what that, for what that might be. I don't. Um, I go to I, I walk into museums around the world, and I find that, by and large, they've got ropes around their necks. I'm at Dumbarton Oaks, and this is one of the ones where this was described as a braid around her neck. Sorry, don't think so. Um, we had an exhibition that I was not involved in um, of Joseph Albers, Joseph and Annie Albers, at the Yale University Art Gallery. They, borrowed this figurine, which I had never seen, from the Joseph Albers uh, 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 Foundation with the little child in front of her. And I went, oh my gosh, there's a rope around the neck. I was in the University of Kansas last year in their storerooms. And I said, do you have any Heine figurines? Everyone's got Heine figurines. And they said, well, probably a couple. We pulled this one out. And I went, oh my gosh, there is a rope around the neck. She's in the blue dress. It is a completely classic example um, of maybe not the most beautifully made example, but such a typical example. Now, I wouldn't want you to think that every Maya figurine from the island of Haina shows someone with a rope around the neck. We see women engaged in many kinds of work as well. It is one of the very interesting things that we get to see labor in practice. 
um, making tortillas, making corn cakes, uh, the sensible sombrero of the woman who goes to the market, um, the uh, woman who carries the bag of unspun cotton because she is a weaver. You sometimes get it in a, a, a modest, cheaper, mold-made version and in a fancier mold-made version. And let me tell you that the whistle is in the same location. Uh, women in the blue dress also carry things on their heads. So let's look at this particular bag, the bag of unspun cotton, because it's a clue about something we know from the early colonial period. And it is that um, Diego Duran gives a picture to us late in the 16th century of the market of, of humans, uh, the market of humans at a place called Momosli in Mexico City. And there are both men for sale and women for sale in this. And the people who are for sale are the ones with the big sticks across their necks. But I want you to see that what the woman who is for sale has is unspun cotton. She is shown that she can run, she can work the drop spindle. She is a talented person for your sweatshop. Well, here we are at the Art Institute of Chicago. She's got the uh, picks that you need for your fine weaving in one hand and the unspun cotton in the other. Um, but it brings us to this other important category of these beautiful women in the blue dress. Um, a number of them are portrayed uh, being groped by old men. And they are coming out of the same mold. Take a look, and you can see how this is different heads, different orientation, different final paint, one mold. And uh, the differences in the faces are quite striking. I began to track down, my eyes became particularly trained to spotting this particular uh, mold out of which this old man would grope this young woman. And by the time I was done uh, counting how many came from the same mold, I was up to nine. Leiden, Berlin, Pesulchak Khan, a little town in Yucatan, uh, the Tamayo Museum in Oaxaca, uh, LACMA, uh, Mexico City, and Mexico City, unknown collection, and this one in Santiago de Chile, and they, she's got a different head. <coughs> Must have broken out off. And you can see that the head is broken. This was a particularly desirable, replicable um, image, and so, this very subject, which some in which some have found uh, humor, clowning, yes, I think some of it is downright funny. Um, but I also think it is pointing to some aspect of the fundamental commerce that was present on the island. And just when you think you understand it, or just when I thought I understood it, I find myself looking at the woman with the bunny and I'm lost. Just a few words about men. Uh, <clears throat> this is a Heine figurine in the uh, Denver um, Art Museum with this very interesting uh, uh, marking on his face. Turns out that there are a number of these as well. Uh, there are particular patterns that are mold-made patterns that are repeated time and again. Those are my glasses for scale. Looking at this particular pattern described on the surface of this man's face. And if you, uh, it is one of the most common markings on a man's face. And it's on all of these. These are little thumbnail pictures I've taken out of early publications. It is on the man who is administering the haircut here. These are on seated warriors. And if you look closely, I think you will see what I see, which is that this is a flowering jawbone that is made manifest on the surface of this face. 
sometimes with teeth, described right here. What is the meaning of this? Who are these men? Some are very explicitly warriors. There's another category of male figure. Here's the excavated example that we saw earlier with these what are often called in cataloging cheek patches. And I finally realized what the cheek patches were when I had the, uh, had the opportunity to examine this mask excavated on Haina in 1963 by Mexico, which seems to show skin. I went to see the taxidermist at the Peabody Museum at Yale for advice. Is this skin? Am I looking at some kind of treated skin? Um, here are what seem to be teeth represented here. And everything knotted here. Well, of course, it's not a photograph. But I feel as though we may be looking at something that marks male figurines as some kind, under some kind of, of role, some kind of active subservience, whether they are wearing the jawbone manifest on the face or what looks like some kind of application of skin to the exterior of their face. Well, there's another category of women. There are only two, really two categories of women. You met the beautiful, the one in the beautiful one in the blue, blue dress. This is the one who doesn't work. This is the one who wears the blue skirt, and she wears a very, usually a very modest top, a weep heel. She has this strange cutout niche in her head. And by and large, most of these women, and this is one where she seems to have a stack of books in her lap, very interesting, could be woven cloth. But I draw your attention to this cut, or this kind of cicatrice that runs from her lips to her ears. It's not on every single one of these, this second very standard type, but it is on almost all of them. What does it mean? Is she silenced? Is this the woman who does not speak? Is this some other kind of role fulfilled by these women on the island of Haina? We see a few of these women as weavers. It is one of the uh, roles that they play. But mostly, they do nothing. They're part of my puzzle for the future. Um, I just would say that I, I want to thank my own young self for, actually, I sometimes want to complain about my own young self. My own young self thought that she knew answers to questions. And I hope that my older self now looks at these uh, Maya figurines, these figurines by and large from the island of Haina, and says, you know, there are many things we're not going to be able to know. But perhaps we can ask better questions about it. Perhaps we can be more. Um, crisp in the categories that we create of these figurines. And perhaps through asking a questions based in larger compendia of the material, we can come to some better understanding of these beautiful, powerful objects that are seeking to speak to us.